Good afternoon, I'm Brad Sears, the Executive Director of the Williams Project, um, soon to be the Williams Institute, and thank you for being here today on the opening event of the fifth annual update on sexual orientation law and the inauguration of the Williams Project as the Williams Institute. Um, I actually get to start the day with two great functions. One is opening the new Williams Institute reading room, and the second is introducing um, Professor Kenji Yoshino. Um, many of you know that we have already had a reading room here in the library. It was actually right behind these bookcases. It was uh, alcove, um, and we actually outgrew it. In the last four years, we have added over 1,300 volumes to a collection on sexual orientation law and public policy. Um, it is an international collection in all types of media and we needed more space and a prettier room. So the founder of the Williams Project, um, Chuck Williams, donated another million dollars to make a $2 million to total donation to fund the collection in the reading room, and I'd like to introduce him, Chuck Williams. Hopefully you'll have time to browse around and look at the collection. Um, it's all open there. Um, we have a range of books, including many books by people that are associated with the Williams Project, such as Gary Gates and Bill Rubenstein and Lee Badgett. Um, the collection dates from the beginning of kind of sexual orientation law materials. Um, D.W. Corey's The Homosexual um, in America, written in 1951. We have three first editions, <coughs> two books up to today, such as covering by Kenji Yoshino. Um, which takes me to my second duty today. And I have to say, I planned this really intelligent introduction of Kenji in this book. It was really bright. I was going to talk about how, you know, the combination of memoir and the law, and ever since we, the people, and the Declaration, first person has always been the starting point for advancing our rights, and move from slave narratives and to the end of slavery, to HRC and Equality Organ, and quality organ collecting stories on their internet sites about um, gay people to fight for marriage equality. I was going to roll in some Eric Erickson and how the mark of a great man is someone who takes their personal issues and universalizes them and comes up with a universal solution. But then I was on my way here. That would have all been very bright. Um, and I was driving the car and I actually started crying. And I was crying because I was listening to National Public Radio, and I don't know if any of you listened to All Things Considered this morning, but they had the story of Danny and Annie Parasa in Brooklyn. Um, and there's been several Danny and Annie stories, and, th and they always choked me up, and this one did too, because Danny now has cancer. And Danny and Annie were sitting in the bedroom in Brooklyn, and Danny was telling the story of his and Annie's marriage. And um, when they got married, Annie's father had died, and she had several brothers, and she didn't want to favor one over the other. So she asked Danny, what do I do? Who do I pick? And he said, we, we're going to walk into that church together, and we're going to walk out together. And then he said, Annie asked me who, who, or I asked Annie who was going to be with her behind the casket when I die. And she said, we walked into this marriage together, or I walked into marriage with you alone, and I'm going to walk out. And it really, you know, kind of got all choked up. And I realized that great stories and great storytellers don't need a lot of fancy window dressing. They kind of speak for themselves. So I just want to get our storyteller up here, Kenji Yoshino, and covering. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. This is an incredible honor. And what I want to do today is to talk really briefly and actually have more of a conversation with you than anything else, because one of the themes of my book is the importance of dialogue. So what I thought I'd do is I'd just give you the guts of the book and then to read from the epilogue and then to open it to questions from you. So, this book is about the harms of coerced conformity and the ways in which unreasoning demands for assimilation can impede the human flourishing, not just of gays and lesbians, not just of traditional civil rights groups, but of all individuals. And when I was first thinking about this project, as many of you know, I wrote it in completely academic and scholarly terms. And when I was trying to rewrite it as a book, I had the sinking feeling that this wasn't going to be enough and that if I wanted to really write a book about the importance of authenticity 
that I would have to risk some authenticity of my own. Because I came to see that, as Nietzsche once said, all philosophy is unconscious and involuntary autobiography. And that there's a reason why certain questions are home questions for us. And for me, my resistance to conformity, I think largely stems from my own lived experience, both as a gay man and as an Asian American. So I wanted to briefly outline uh, the genesis of the argument, which is to say that as I came of age as a gay man, I realized that I was moving through three weakening demands for assimilation. And I think this story will be familiar to many of you in the audience. When I was a teenager, the only thing that I wanted to do was to convert to being straight. So the first phase was conversion. And in the second phase, I accepted that I was gay, but I masked that identity to others. So I would call this the passing phase. And then finally, even after I'd come out of the closet, I still experienced demands to assimilate to straight norms. And this, barring Irving Goffman's term, I will call the covering phase. And the covering phase was the most surprising one to me because after I came out of the closet, I thought I was done, and I thought I could finally stop thinking about my sexual orientation. But when I started teaching at Yale Law School nine years ago, a friend of mine took me aside, and he put his arm around me, and he said, Kenji, you'll have a lot easier time getting tenure here if you're a homosexual professional than if you're a professional homosexual. <laughs> And the funny thing was, I knew exactly what he meant. He meant that I would do much better as a mainstream constitutional law professor who just happened to be gay than I would as a gay professor who worked on gay rights and engaged in gay activism. And what was interesting to me about this was that it had occurred so long after I had come out because all of my colleagues knew I was gay. But nonetheless, I was being asked to assimilate to the dominant straight norm. I should say in defense of my colleagues at Yale Law School that I didn't listen to this demand for long, you know, with mentors like Bill Rubenstein, who was teaching there at the time. I uh, sort of uh, opened the closet door and everything came tumbling out and uh, have been working on gay rights issues uh, ever since um, we worked together. So I didn't take this advice, and when I didn't, I was immediately embraced by my colleagues. So I would be doing them a real disservice if I didn't acknowledge how um, they embraced me with open arms once I had the courage to write from my passions. But this got me to thinking that there are real harms to assimilation because I would never have known had I simply assimilated to the mainstream and been that mainstream constitutional law professor who eschewed gay rights, you know, how much potential there was for uh, acceptance by my colleagues but also joy in the work that I have come to do. And so as I was thinking about these three demands for assimilation, conversion, passing, and covering, it struck me that they were not just demands that I had moved through as an individual, but also demands that the gay community had moved through as a group. So if we go back to the middle decades of the 20th century, we see that gays and lesbians were being forced into conversion therapy, whether through psychoanalysis, lobotomies, electroshock treatment, or even castration. And it was only with the rise of the gay rights movement in the latter decades of the 20th century that we began to see a shift in emphasis from the covering, sorry, from the conversion demand to the passing demand. And I don't want to say that this shift was categorical because obviously some forms of conversion therapy still occur today. But it became increasingly the norm that gays and lesbians would not be witch hunted out of our closets so long as we spent our entire lives there. And that shift was exemplified by the military's 1993 don't ask, don't tell policy, where the military moved from a policy of categorical exclusion of gays, a conversion regime, to the don't ask, don't tell policy under which gays are ostensibly allowed to serve so long as we remain in the closet. Finally, at the turn of the millennium, I feel like we as a community are entering the covering phase of our fight for civil rights and full equality. So increasingly, in many sectors of American society, I feel like there is tolerance b both for being gay and even for saying that you are gay, but not for quote-unquote flaunting. 
And I feel like the debates about same-sex marriage are often debates about covering because opponents of same-sex marriage are often saying it's fine to be gay, it's fine even to say that you're gay, but don't shove it in our faces, don't flaunt. We want you to cover this up. Right. So as I thought about this trajectory, you know, one personal, one collective that our community has gone through, I began to realize that one of the things that the gay community could give back to the civil rights paradigm as a whole was a skepticism about assimilation. Because I think that in this country we've always had, since the revolutionary period, a dream of the melting pot ideal. And assimilation was seen as this benign force that would make us all into equals. But as a gay experience shows, assimilation can often not be a leveling force, but rather a subordinating one. And assimilation can often not be a simple escape from discrimination, but precisely the effect of that discrimination. And so I began to think about other ways in which this paradigm might actually affect other groups like racial minorities or women. Because in the usual civil rights paradigm, we have this trickle-down theory where you know, things trickle down from race to sex to sexual orientation. And as Eve Sedgwick says, it's always more interesting and the pressure of application goes both ways. And so thinking about the ways in which the gay rights paradigm might enrich the whole civil rights paradigm, not just for us, but for all who take shelter within it. And when I, when I was thinking about the ways in which other minority groups might be forced to assimilate, it struck me that conversion and passing were going to be much less relevant than covering. Because most racial minorities and most women, although the exceptions are not rare and are not unimportant, uh, cannot convert and cannot pass. However, when we get to the covering demand, suddenly there's interest convergence among all civil rights groups because racial minorities are pressed to act white and assimilate to white norms. Women are told to play like men at work and to not talk about their children, lest they be seen as mothers first and colleagues second. And individuals with disabilities are asked to downplay their disabilities so that others find it easy to disattend. Again, my hero Irving Goffman's favorite example to distinguish passing from covering was that of President FDR, who used to always make sure that he was behind a table before his cabinet entered. So he wasn't passing, right, because everybody knew he was in a wheelchair, but he was covering in the sense that he wanted to make sure that his more conventionally presidential qualities were in the forefront of the interaction and his disability was in the background. And then with religion, you know, it's a very sad fact of which we're all aware that after 9-11, uh, Muslims are the prime targets of the covering demand. And so there are many internal debates within the Muslim com community as to whether or not Muslim women should drop their uh, headscarves or their veils or their Arabic in public so as not to be the victims of harassment. And recently, a Sikh man was approached by some men who thought he was a Muslim and said, take off your turban, and when he refused, they beat him unconscious. So these covering demands are common to all of us, and they can also be quite serious in their consequences. American law and a discrimination law as it stands now, generally, not across the board, but generally, does not protect us against such covering demands. So if an African American is fired for her skin color, I want to be that woman's lawyer because she will win her Title VII lawsuit in a hot second. But if an African American woman gets fired for wearing cornrows to work, she will not have a claim as the 1981 case of Rogers versus American Airlines shows. If a woman is fired for having two X chromosomes, for being a woman, she will not uh, have any problems finding redress. But if she gets fired for behaving in too feminine a way or for being a mother, the outcome is much less clear. And of course, in some jurisdictions, you can still be fired for just being gay. But even in the jurisdictions that protect individuals against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, there is still a great, greater vulnerability for gays who are perceived as flaunting. So I'm thinking here of the 1998 case of Shahar versus Bowers, in which Michael Bowers of Bowers versus Hardwick fame fired Robin Shahar. And he said, I didn't fire her for being gay or saying she was gay because I knew that she was gay when I hired her. So I wasn't asking her to convert or to pass. I fired her because she engaged in a private, religious, same-sex commitment ceremony. And that was flaunting her sexual orientation. And that brought kind of shame and opprobrium to the office. 
So again, the line is between being and doing, and the law is much less inclined to protect doing the things that are culturally associated with the identity than being the identity itself, assuming that being the identity is protected under law. So what is the remedy that I would propose to this? Well, I think that there are both legal remedies and cultural remedies. And I'm just going to really briefly sketch the legal ones, because I assume that uh, I'll get some Q&A on this. But the legal remedies that I'm looking at uh, include existing remedies under uh, both the Equal Protection Clause and uh, Title VII, so thinking about disparate treatment and disparate impact suits where Title VII is concerned. But I'm increasingly enamored of the idea that we might want to move away from equality claims, which are group-based in nature, and toward liberty claims, which are universal to us all. So if we think about the Lawrence case, for example, where the Supreme Court struck down the Texas sodomy statute, the Supreme Court explicitly eschewed deciding that as an equality case, and instead said the right to sexual intimacy is one that we all as individuals who are within the jurisdiction of the United States share. And I like this approach because it focuses on what draws us together rather than what drives us apart. And I can say more about this strategy, which is exemplified in some other recent cases as well, uh, but uh, I will leave that to Q&A. Because in some ways I feel like the more surprising point of this book is that I think that many of the solutions to covering demands are cultural rather than legal in nature. So when I think about the ways in which I was asked to cover, many of the people who were making those demands of me were not people who I think the law can or even should reach. They were not the state or the employers, and to that extent I can count myself very lucky. They were instead people like my family, my peer groups, you know, my friends, my colleagues to some extent, sometimes even my students. And quite often the covering demand, the demand to assimilate and to conform, came from myself. It was an internal voice inside of me. And while I'm almost too often inclined to sue myself, I recognize that that's not my healthiest impulse. <laughs> Another reason why I think that the covering demand uh, has its primary redress in the cultural realm rather than the legal realm is because the law is always going to be limited in the number of groups or rights that it covers. So whenever I give this talk, I've become accustomed to a response, which I think of as the angry, straight, white guy response, where a member of the audience, who's usually a white man, who's usually quite angry, at least annoyed, says, I understand why the anti-discrimination law should protect you against being a racial minority or being a woman or being gay, but I don't understand why individuals shouldn't have to cover because after all, I have to cover all the time. I have to cover my depression or my schizophrenia or my working class background or the fact that I'm illiterate or the fact that I'm an artist, you know, even a positive identity like that. So why is it that I always feel like in civil rights discourse, I as a white man am always assumed to be an impediment to the civil rights of others rather than an individual who might also have some interest in resisting assimilation and inhabiting an authentic self of my own. And I think I surprise these individuals when I agree with them because at least in the cultural realm, when we move outside of the law, we can understand the radical breadth of the civil rights aspiration. Because civil rights for me has always been the project of allowing us to pursue our human flourishing without limitations based on bias or witless conformity. And that aspiration applies not just to gay people, not just to individuals who belong to traditional anti-discrimination groups, but to all human beings. And we could spin this in one of two directions, right? Which is to say, we could say, well, assimilation is just the tax we pay for living in a civilized society. If we all have to give it up, what's the big deal, right? And I guess I have two responses to that. One is that certain burdens are not equally distributed. So I'm not saying that discrimination against poets is the same as discrimination against African Americans. You know, I think the law has prioritized uh, these identities basically correctly in terms of what it protects and what it doesn't. But I guess my second and perhaps more profound response is to say, why would we necessarily characterize it that way? Why would we say, because we all do it, 
we all have to suck it up and this is a tax we pay for entering civilization. Why wouldn't we reverse the spin of that point and say, if we're all doing it and we would all be better off if we were allowed to express our authenticity, so long as it wasn't harming another individual, then why wouldn't we be able to make common cause precisely around the fact that we are all different in these ways? And so the one thing that we know about explosive pluralism in this society is that no one is fully inside of the mainstream. It is not normal to be normal in America in 2006. And so what this book tries to do is to try and make the civil rights project a universal project, not just about gays, not just about traditional civil rights groups, but for all human beings. So with that said, I thought I would read from the epilogue to my book uh, because I think that the epilogue uh, kind of exemplifies both of those points. First of all, that there are some identities that fall outside of the canon of identity politics as traditionally construed, but nonetheless are extremely precious to the individuals who hold them and are worthy of protection. But second of all, that the ways in which we can protect individuals from these harms of coerced conformity are often social rather than legal in nature. So I think that the only thing I need to say to set this up is that this uh, epilogue is about a wedding I attended, and the wedding was of the woman that I had a relationship with in college. Because I know where to look, I can see the blue star even across the crowded ballroom. It smolders at the tip of Janet's left shoulder blade above the wedding gown. It looks entirely of her body, at this distance, like a birthmark. Only at a conversational closeness will its strict geometry reveal it to be a tattoo. At 30, Janet quips the tattoo is the best investment she has ever made. As this day approached, her conservative Korean parents offered her escalating sums of money to have it removed, <laughs> or at least to hide it. But here it is, blue star on brown skin, between bands of black hair and white gown, like a painting of Bethlehem after Rothko. As I watch her, a ripple passes over her back, meaning she is laughing. She grasps the hand of one of the aunts in Hanbuk, who has flown in from Korea for the occasion. Janet's voice is wry and authoritative, surprisingly deep for her small, fine-boned body. So while she laughs frequently, her laughter sounds like something bestowed. At the reception that has just ended, her maid of honor broke down in tears as she gave her speech. Janet hugged her with a tearless laugh. Why did this gesture, which would have seemed brusque in another, stir such warmth in me when made by her? The summer between my two years at Oxford, in the midst of my Great Depression, I went to stay with her. Janet was living at the boarding school where she had finished a year of teaching English. She would start medical school in the fall. The term had ended long ago. The dormitory swelled with the silence of a structure not fulfilling its purpose. Janet had sent in her grades for her students, boxed her 572 compact discs, and stored all her books except for the Norton Anthology of Poetry, from which we memorized a poem a day. Between us, we could name the nine muses. Both of us knew that in the coming year, we would change, that we would have to change, and that, as her father said on her answering machine, the road to hell was very wide. <laughs> we packed it, black box of the future, in a cardboard one of denial. So while neither of us used the word sanctuary, that was where we lived then. The outside world was a picture framed by the window, no more real than the neighboring photograph of zebras on the Serengeti. I remember watching her as she fell asleep one night, her white shirt tied at the waist. The blue undersheet of the futon showed her still as a continent against an oceanic expanse. I was a cartographer, student of her. I watched her and thought of her purple dress, her dreams of tigers in the trees, how she balanced on her heels as she stood and thought. Janet wrote her undergraduate thesis on Milton. There's a moment in Paradise Lost where Adam asks the angel Raphael how angels have sex. Raphael 
a blush of celestial rosy red, love's proper hue, and answers it is nothing so crude as human intercourse, as angels find no obstacle in membrane, joint, or limb. Rather, he says, easier than air with air, if spirits embrace, total they mix, union of pure with pure, desiring nor restrained conveyance need, as flesh to mix with flesh. Since then, these lines have limbed my dream of sex, discorporation, clean mixing of molecules, no bodies or bed springs, just a passing through. I watched her and I thought of these lines, wondering why I could not love her. If I wanted Milton's angelic mingling with her, why would a body be a barrier? I still return to this question without an answer. A friend speaks deeply to it when she says she became so ill in her adolescence she effectively did not have a body. Since returning to it, she finds herself unable to care much for shapes, whether people's bodies are male or female, tall or short, large or small. As someone who aspires to read through the surface of texts, I am bemused at how my erotic readings of people snag so insistently on surfaces. As she started medical school, Janet got the tattoo. She chose the blue star of a Philip Levine poem in which the star appears on a man's chest, tiny and perfect. The man is a working man who makes the glare for light bulbs, desirous of normalcy, he wants none of it. But after the surgeon cuts it off, he announces to his patient that underneath it is another perfect blue star, presumably under that one, another. Janet and I fought over the tattoo. I told her she had misconstrued the nature of time. In 30 years, I said, she would be an entirely different person, but the tattoo would still be there to embarrass her. Who was she, at 24, to bind that future self? Janet responded that I was the one who had misconstrued time. She agreed that over the next years, she would change, that she would have to change. Yet she said if her future self was embarrassed by the star, she wanted it to be embarrassed. She was entering a time in her life when her commitment to poetry would become more endangered than ever. And she wanted to protect that commitment by writing it on her body. If she became a doctor who stopped reading and writing poetry, she wanted to hear the reproach of this younger self. My mistake, she said, was that I assumed people got wiser as they got older. So the star is still here on her wedding day. I still dislike tattoos, except for this one, which I love out of mind. Thank you.